Good morning, everybody. I think we have connected now to the video and uh, the sound also, uh, hopefully, uh, for the online uh, people. So if somebody on the chat could, uh, let's say, respond that indeed we're also heard online, that would be great. Yeah, thank you. Welcome, everybody, uh, for uh, this, uh, let's say, uh, uh, third engagement uh, with you all on scenario building uh, 2024. Uh, before we start with the content and the welcome, I would like to mention at least that uh, this uh, session will be recorded and also pictures will be taken. So if you don't want to be in the picture, then uh, please let us know. Then we can make sure that that's uh, taken care of. Um, like I said, the third, we started in July 22nd with uh, the storylines uh, engagement with you all uh, trying to pick that up went to February with the scenario update, and now, uh, let's say, uh, today, looking with you with the real content. But before I go into what we have done, also uh, would like to introduce myself, uh, Alan Cruz, uh, steering group convener from NSUE side for the joint uh, NSUE, NSUG uh, scenario building uh, work group. That means together with Thilo sitting next to me, uh, being responsible from uh, the say steering the whole part, but also, of course, all the work is being done by the team itself, which they will present themselves uh, later on today because they have the biggest uh, role in uh, today's uh, workshop uh, to, let's say, inform you all. I think uh, what we have uh, now uh, done between the last, uh, let's say, stakeholder uh, workshop in July was work quite a lot on improvements, on the methodologies, on how to deal with things, uh, but also uh, getting the data uh, together. Uh, as the framework uh, guidelines from Acer uh, stipulates, uh, our scenario should be compliant with all the targets, and there are some other uh, elements, but trying to get, let's say, bottom-up data collection, uh, trying to look at the top-down uh, storylines and making sure that all fits within the new context, within the new targets, uh, was, let's say, uh, quite a lot of work. Uh, that's also why uh, we have been, let's say, working uh, quite hard to deliver this. The timing might have been a bit easier uh, to, let's say, share with you earlier on, but uh, let's say, uh, like always, uh, the devil is in the details, and we uh, wanted to at least make sure that what we present and what we want your engagement with is of uh, good quality. So that's why we are today here, and I'm uh, very happy that we can now make the next step into stakeholder engagement in our whole scenario building process uh, with you, uh, namely that you're also involved in uh, the details indeed of our starting position. So on the content, on the numbers, uh, where do we start our simulations with? This has been, let's say, our aim for this uh, scenario building process, uh, recognizing uh, that this is where, let's say, the most, uh, let's say, decisions are being taken. So, yes, it starts with storyline, but that's high over, but then drilling it down to what are the input parameters is what makes the scenario work. And that's why, let's say, I'm uh, very proud that we have been able to get it uh, up and running, uh, get the data together, and, uh, let's say, share with you in the school station process, where today in the workshop, We'll go, uh, let's say, explaining you what we did, what we've been looking at, and also, let's say, uh, later this afternoon for the participants here in Brussels, even go into a deep dive uh, with specific items in uh, four uh, deep dive sessions. Uh, the agenda is now uh, displayed for you, so we have quite a packed uh, agenda, but luckily with some coffee breaks so and a lunch uh, for the ones here here, so that there is at least uh, also some uh, room uh, to verify things, to take, a, let's say, a bio break, et cetera, uh, make sure that the uh, day uh, goes well. And uh, hopefully, uh, let's say, we'll see uh, together, uh, uh, let's say, a successful uh, first engagement, and where we still have, let's say, the open uh, consultation on the website, which ends at August 8th for your uh, formal feedback. All... Uh, preparation has, done, uh, has been done. We've also tried to, let's say, increase our level of transparency, introducing new tools, 
so you're able to go to the nitty gritty of our uh, data uh, and uh, you'll find that there is uh, quite a lot of information available. Uh, maybe too much, but that means uh, today we'll give you the overview. Um, looking at the interaction, uh, we have opened a Slido uh, app. Uh, that means, let's say, uh, we ask you to engage also here uh, through the Slido app because the Slido has uh, one big advantage. You can like already mentioned questions. And we have, uh, let's say, agreed that the most liked will be dealt today in the workshop. And the other ones will be, uh, let's say, communicated afterwards. Uh, but that means if you want your question today, uh, put it on Slido, uh, hope for a hope of likes, and uh, we can uh, engage in uh, that way. Um, I think this is, let's say, uh, from my part, uh, welcome and creating the setting. And I would like you to uh, jump with me into the content and I'll hand over uh, to uh, Gideon our uh, master of uh, stakeholder engagement. So let's see if the slides will go forwards. I'm not going forwards. I'm pressing right and it's not going forwards. Now it is. Was it me, was it you? Okay, then. So yes, um, thank you very much everybody. Gideon Saunders, Stakeholder Engagement Lead or um, Master of Stakeholders or whatever my new title was. Thank you very much for that, Alan. Um, so we wanted to give you a brief update on, on what we're trying to do. Um, this is clearly a big part of it and it's a real pleasure to have so many people here, also people online. Um, and uh, also to, to give you a little bit of information on what will be coming. There will be a few opportunities over the next few months for stakeholders to get involved. And we already did a, an update webinar in the spring with the goal of trying to give you information on what's coming. Now we're in, uh, we've are in. we got a new situation, more information, new timelines to a certain extent as well on certain parts. We want to make sure you're up to date on that as well. So, um, Alan, was that me or was that you now? That was me. Okay, so we've got it working. So just very um very briefly first of all what are our goals with stakeholder engagement so first of all um the goal is to utilize and maximize the expertise of the external stakeholders that's the point of this we have expertise internally we've been developing these scenarios we're very proud of the work that we're doing at the same time we recognize that we're not working in a vacuum there's a lot of expertise out there and we want to make sure that we get the best interaction so we can get the best possible scenarios um, the timely and successful completion of the TYNP scenarios is clearly, obviously, a goal. Um, this is an extremely uh, intensive process, which goes over two years, and um, it's very important for us that we can achieve all of our timelines. So simply writing this on a slide, there's, there's a lot to this, and that's definitely something which we have to work hard to achieve. Promote confidence in the scenario building process. We want you to understand what we're doing and why we're doing it. We want to be transparent with you, and the only way that we can promote that confidence is by giving you the information and giving you the chance to ask. We want to investigate the low and high scenarios that could be used in the 2026 cycle. This is a topic which we've already um, presented at the start of this process. And most importantly, um, last of all, well, most importantly, we want to ensure fulfillment of the regulatory obligations as well. This is not just some private scenario. These scenarios are fixed in the TENI regulation. We have regulatory obligations we want to achieve, and the regulation is there not just for us, the regulation is there for everybody. And that's why it's important that the stakeholders are involved as well, so that we can really achieve something with this. None? I'm not sure I'm working again. I get the feeling when the video stops that I can't click anymore. There we go. Thanks a lot. Um, so the transparency in the stakeholder development process. So there are a couple of updates which we wanted to share with you today, things which are, are new, things which have uh, changed since the update webinar in the spring. First and most importantly, I think when it comes to your access to, to the scenarios, is that we have a new T1EP 2024 scenarios website. That's now online. You may have already used it when you were preparing for this consultation. If not, you may use it in the coming weeks when you prepare for the written consultation. There was a question previously what we wanted to do with the, um, the previous websites, so the websites for the 2022, 2020 scenarios, and so on and so forth. Um, we don't want to deactivate those websites because there is a great deal of data there which people can use to look into the history to understand where things were in the past, to see the trajectory, 
um, to see the development. Um, at the same time, it's very important for us that nobody looks at those websites and thinks that they are the most up-to-date information. That's what the 2024 website is for. That's why those websites won't be deactivated. They will be ordered in a way that anybody who wants to use them can get all the information which was there previously, but it will be made quite clear that this is not the most up-to-date um, scenarios website. The new website would include the Sedora line report. When we're that far, it will also include the draft and then the scenario report, but not at that stage yet. Um, it will also include the methodologies for the scenario quantification, the scenario building guidelines, and the innovation roadmap. Again, some of these points are coming later. Um, it will also include a list of all the bilateral meetings that we've had. It will include the, the consultation, the questions, and also the responses that we receive. And it will include also responses that we receive um, from you, for example, in the workshop today. The idea here is that Anybody who misses this, these events, for example, this event today, can come back later on and see what was discussed, see the questions and see the answers as well. It will also include the data sets and the assumptions which are published uh, in both aggregated and disaggregated format in line with the confidentiality requirements of the data providers. And it will also include a data visualization platform for you to be able to get in behind the data yourself. What's still upcoming? We're going to have a central scenarios web page as well. The idea here, this comes back to what we were saying about the previous website. There'll be a sort of a central landing page so that everybody can, can easily access the scenarios. And from there, you'll see which is the most up-to-date scenario material, what is past material as well. So let's take a quick look at the timeline. Oh, no, I think we went past the timeline there. So I'll just go back. Um, so let's take a look at the timeline. So. Um, this is, as I said, it's a two year process. Um, to be honest, actually it goes on more than two years because it's one of those things that before one cycle is finished, the next cycle is starting. Um, we kicked this off last year and in the spring of this year, we had a stakeholder update webinar because we felt that that block between Q3 2022 and Q1 2023 was quite long. We wanted everyone to know what was going on. After that, we've been working busily internally um, and now we're ready to release the input parameters and begin the five week consultation, which, as you know, began earlier on this month. Um, we're holding the consultation workshop. That's the point of this morning and the stakeholder roundtables, which are this afternoon. Um, we're also at the stage now that the scenario is ETAG. That's the, um, the reference group will be able to be created. Um, we'll come back to that in a moment. I'll have a slide on that. After the summer break. We'll get into taking on board what was come what comes through this consultation, and we will prepare the draft scenarios. Um, the draft scenarios will be re released in Q4, and there will be another six week consultation period. Going with that six week consultation period, there will be a consultation workshop. Usually, we have this about two weeks after the start of the consultation, like now, to give you the opportunity to get the information and to ask questions. After that, we will re we'll release the the draft scenarios post consultation. Um, and then we begin the, the process, process with ASA, the member states, and the commission as well. First of all, we'll receive opinions on the draft scenarios, and then ultimately there will be the approval process and the publication of the final scenarios, which we expect to take place the middle uh, later next year. Now, I could ask you to click on, please. Perfect, thanks a lot. So the scenarios ETAG, the scenarios external technical advisory group. Um, we've had a few questions over the previous weeks about what's going on with that, what's the latest status of that. So I wanted to give you a little bit of an update on, on what's what's happening here. So first of all, the, the basic information here. So this is a proposal which is anchored in the TENI regulation, Article 12.3. It's also an ACES scenario framework guidelines. The goal is that this advisory group should be set up with the aim of formally enhancing stakeholder inclusion in the scenario development process. The group will participate in the scenarios development process, in particular on key elements such as the development of assumptions and how they are reflected in the scenarios data. The group will organize itself and act independently from ENSOE and ENSOC with the aim of providing timely expert input to the development of the scenarios in accordance with the scenario development timeline. That's the scope, if you like, of the Scenarios External Technical Advisory Group. But what's actually happening in terms of the development of this? Well, now I'm going to ask you to move on, please. Thanks a lot. So what's the current status? So 
as the previous slide stated, we, this group will act independently of NSOC and NSOE. Our task was to facilitate the creation of this group. Our job is to get it running and then to let it run. Um, we organized a call for candidates, which took place from the 5th of May to the 5th of June, a public call for candidates. Applicants were able to, to apply to take part in the process. Um, there were stakeholder categories, so you applied to take part based on a uh, within a specific stakeholder category. Um, those were outlined in the TENI regulation. We didn't create the categories, the categories were there in the TENI regulation and the scenario framework guidelines. Not all of those stakeholder categories were filled though within that uh, one month period. We got a lot of candidates, but we didn't fill every single category. For that reason, we reopened a second call for candidates from the 12th of June to the 19th of June to try to fill a few extra seats because the goal here is to get people in, to get people involved, and we wanted to fulfill as many stakeholder categories as possible. Um, we haven't managed to fill every category now, but we do have more applicants because of that. What happens now is that internally we've gone through the applications, and those applications have now been assessed internally based on the criteria which was set out in the terms of reference which we discussed with ASA previous, uh, earlier this year. Um, we've created a list of successful applications, um, and that's now been sent to ASA and to the European Commission for their feedback. When we know if those, uh, that ASA and the EC have agreed to that list, then we will inform the applicants um, of if they've been successful or not. If someone hasn't been successful in that application, we'll explain why not. That will happen by mid-August. What about after that? Well, as I said previously, the um, the scenarios ETAG is not something which uh, is we are directly involved in organizing. The group will act independently, so they will begin their first meeting after that. Um, we expect that will be in sometime in September, but as, as I said, ultimately that's the group's decision. On top of the scenarios ETAG, and this is very important, we will now have a formal scenarios external technical advisory group, which will be advising us. At the same time, it's very important to make clear to all of you here, just because you may not be in this group, this does not mean that we do not welcome your feedback as well. Feedback is always welcome, both via the workshops and the, the consultations, but also outside of the workshops and the consultations as well. And for that reason, I wanted to have this slide in here as well to underline one more time, how can stakeholders come anytime? All stakeholders are invited at all times to provide any kind of written feedback or to ask for any clarification which they would like. Where there is specific information which is required, and so and so we may reach out to specific stakeholders. This is something we've been doing since the scenarios were created and we'll continue to do it. Of course, now with the scenarios ETAC, we would have an ideal group to work with on that. But where we need specific information, we go to the people with that specific information. And finally, most importantly, whenever there's any kind of correspondence here, whenever there's any kind of exchange, that, that correspondence, that communication will be recorded, it will be documented on the Scenarios website so you will know what we're doing and who we're talking to. Okay, then um, with that, I'm at the end of the, uh, the stakeholder engagement section. I'm very interested to hear any questions that you may have. Um, but right now, I'll pass over to Nala and to Alex. Will take us on with the scenario strategy, storylines, and targets. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Nail Ambuk, and uh, I am the scenario building project manager from the NSOE side. Um, I will go through some slides about the scenario strategy and the storyline, and then I will hand over to Alexander, my colleague, uh, so that he will present you through the targets. Uh, so, starting from the uh, scenario strategy, the framework of the scenarios. This is really important, uh, and this is the similar view what we have presented to you in our last workshop in uh, February, uh, showing that um, uh, overall six scenarios uh, in scope of 20 p 2024 scenarios will be created. Uh, so when we look at the uh, input parameters, which we will uh, present to you in a, uh, af uh, after within this uh, consultation and the roundtables, it's important to understand the framework of the scenarios and uh, their storylines. Uh, so uh, we have uh, developed the scenarios uh, for three time, three main time horizons, which is 2030, 2040 and 2050. Uh, but meanwhile, we will also have a screen uh, snapshots to present the view uh, in 2035. 
Uh, in 2030, we will see only uh, one scenario, which is aligned with the ACERS framework guideline that sees one central scenario for 2030. So uh, this scenario uh, uh, called National Trends Plus scenario. So as it says with the name, uh, the National Trends scenario uh, is a bottom-up uh, methodology. So uh, we uh, con uh, contact with the TSOs, both for electricity and the gas, and we ask them to provide the data sets for the supply and demand according to their uh, NECPs. As you may know that uh, now the draft NECPs are expected to be uh, submitted to the Commission uh, within this summer. So uh, we asked uh, TSOs to provide their best view and best estimate anticipating this upcoming NECPs. And considering the time of the data collection that would allow us the alignment, aggregation uh, and the quality checks, there might not be exactly the same which uh, not even published uh, for some of the countries. Uh, so um, here uh, it's said that these uh, data sets presents the uh, upcoming NECPs. And uh, there is also the plus there. Uh, the National Trends Plus means that uh, for this cycle, we will not just aggregate all the data sets and present as a national trend, but we have an obligation comes from the 10E regulation, says that all scenarios has to be uh, compliant with the targets, uh, unions uh, 2030 targets. So we will then make a check uh, whether uh, the scenario is aligned with the targets. And if it's not, uh, we will um, apply a methodology to bring them on the targets as it's uh, explained in the gap closing methodology on the download uh, page you can find within the storyline as an annex two. So I want to make sure that uh, these national trends data sets are published prior to this adjustment. Uh, but um, it is important that as these are collected through the TSOs as their best view, these are not for consultation. This is also made clear in the ACERS framework guideline. But however, we do publish this gap closing methodology uh, for the consultation so that uh, taking your feedbacks, we can improve this methodology, uh, taking your views as well. Then we go to the 2040. In 2040, you see uh, the continuation of this orange dot, which is the National Trends 2040, again collected through the TSOs as their best view uh, for the NECPs. And also there is uh, two deviation scenarios, which we called the distributed energy and global ambition. So here it's important that our starting point 2030 for all scenarios, uh, but uh, there is an expansion and optimization for this blue and uh, purple deviation scenarios. So uh, based on the uh, their input parameters, the deviation starts from 2030 NT plus scenario towards uh, to uh, their um, results according to their storyline. So the aim of these two scenarios is that um, we make sure that uh, the energy transition uh, during the energy transition, there are some uh, uncertainties, several uncertainties uh, that uh, uh, we will see in the near in the future, and we need to uh, capture these uncertainties as much as possible. So we created these two deviation scenarios, um, and we created their storylines, which I will explain you in a minute, uh, so that we make sure, as the extent possible, uh, we cover these uncertainties. And there is NT plus. NT plus is uh, not an optimization. Uh, not an expansion, so it's again the same as 2030, uh, just aggregation of the data sets provided by the TSOs. Uh, so uh, the, this NT plus can stay somewhere in between, and which we will show you uh, after today. And in 2050, of course, it's uh, quite difficult to have a uh, aligned uh, uh, gather all data sets from all. Uh, uh, member, uh, all members, so we don't have any more the national trends, uh, and we have the continuation of this distributed energy and global ambition. So uh, I mentioned about the storylines uh, of these two scenario, uh, we try to differentiate them based on the most important high-level drivers that would affect the transition of the energy system. Uh, so what would be the um, this uh, high-level drivers? It's actually 
the uh, stakeholders that have a, a, a closer eye to the scenario building process uh, will know it very well because uh, these are the continuation of the 2022 scenarios uh, storylines. So uh, these are distributed energy, high European autonomy with more decentralized technology focus. And in global ambition, we see the global economy with centralized low carbon and rest opinions. So uh, while creating this, developing these scenarios together with the stakeholders, of course, because these are coming from already uh, from the last cycle where we had the extensive stakeholder consultation uh, for that, and uh, we defined uh, these four high level drivers that would affect the way of uh, the differences uh, will affect most the transition of the, this energy system uh, in the perspective of uh, the infrastructure. So these are green transition. Uh, both scenarios are have to be in line with the targets. There is no question here. Uh, and uh, where the differentiation starts in the story is the driving force of the energy transition in distributed energy. This is um, uh, driven uh, by uh, prosumer and local level. Uh, we see uh, better consumer behavior, better circularity, uh, and also we see the more decentralized technologies like. We will see more PV, uh, we will see more uh, batteries, we will see more um, uh, more wind uh, onshore, uh, and uh, the, in the technologies, the focus will be mostly on the electric heat pumps and also district heating, and in the transport sector, we will see higher share of EVs, but of course, supplemented with the e liquids and uh, biofuels for the heavy transport, and uh, we will see minimal carbon capture, storage, and nuclear technologies. Whereas in global ambition, uh, this transition initiated in the national and international, European and the international level, and we will uh, see that uh, there is a um, there is a also increase uh, energy efficiency and reduce energy demand and. Priority is given uh, to the de decarbonization and also very important currently is the diversification of the energy supply. And here we see the centralized uh, technologies uh, with supplemented with low carbon energy and imports. So here we will see more uh, wind offshore uh, utility scale batteries. Uh, we will see a um, wide range of uh, heating technologies on top of electric heat pumps. We will see hybrid heat pumps uh, quite uh, a lot. And also in the transport, we will see a wide range of energy careers. We will see also hydrogen, uh, e-liquids and biofuels, and also the integration of nuclear and carbon capture and uh, storage. Uh, now I will hand over Alex to you uh, for the targets. Okay. Thanks, Nellen. So maybe before we look at the targets, uh, my name is Alexander Ketlitz. I'm Scenario Subject Manager from NSERC. Um, and now I will go a bit through the targets that the scenarios um, will comply with. So as Nellen mentioned already, all scenarios are aligned with the Union 2030 targets and the 2050 target of uh, net zero. On top of that, like we did for the last scenario cycle, we also develop a carbon budget, but that will be subject uh, later today. Um, I think in, in, in around about an hour, we will talk about the carbon budget. So I park this topic for now. Zooming in to the 2030 targets, um, what do we have here? Um, first is that we comply with the 55% greenhouse gas reduction compared to 1990. Then um, the energy efficiency principle is reflected by complying with the 11.7% reduction of the final energy demand, which is translated into an upper final energy demand limit of 8,873 terawatt hours. So this is something um, that is valid for all scenarios. So the 2030 targets are valid for National Trend Plus, of course, for 2030, but we will also make sure that 2040, 2050 shows a reasonable trajectory in terms of the final energy demand. Then further targets for 2030 is the 42.5% rest share. Then we have the offshore targets, the member states non-binding agreements that we um, include in our scenarios. And we have specific targets related to certain sectors, for example, in the transport sector, 
or in the industry. So that's about 2030. If we now jump to 2050, then we have not specific targets, but as I mentioned, the, the reasonable trajectories um, coming from the 2030 targets developed to 2050. Plus, we have the net zero emissions target, net zero um, requirement, and we have the offshore targets um, coming from the member states as non-binding agreement. Um, that would be it. I think we are a bit behind time, so I will stop here and open the floor to any questions. So um, we have already some questions uh, in uh, Slido. Uh, so uh, I'm sharing it now in the screen. I think the first question have been already answered. Uh, and uh, we can take uh, these three questions which are here. Uh, all right, uh, so you can. Uh, we can just go for the second one. Okay. All right. The first one is uh, being answered currently with um, with David. Uh, and when we look at the also um, first question and the third question is actually uh, kind of interlinked. Uh, but I lost. Ah, it's here. So uh, the question is that whether distributed energy scenario will include the production, the centralized production of hydrogen and biomethane, or uh, will it still include the carbon capture, storage, and biomethane? Uh, in following slides, we will try to explain you uh, the methodology how we created the input parameters, and there we'll, we will see that these are not uh, uh, that this doesn't mean that one scenario uh, totally disregards uh, one single technology. Uh, so. Uh, we will see, uh, we saw, as we saw in also 2022 scenarios, that all technologies are relevant and necessary to achieve uh, the carbon neutrality. But uh, what we do is that uh, we try to find the plausible ranges and the uncertainties of uh, initiated uh, uh, with these technologies. So uh, we try to tend the model, go to the lower range of uh, one uh, this during uh, within these possible ranges. We ask one scenario to go a bit lower and uh, we uh, make one scenario go a bit higher. Um, if we can take uh, another question, maybe um, you want to take. Yeah, I mean, we can, I see if you go off one question, it's like about... Uh, um, I will just... Yeah, do we have this one? Yeah, so um, do this scenario include the Repower U targets? Um, the answer is yes and no, <laughs> um, because we see that um, there were certain targets set out by Fit for 55 and Repower U that differs, for example, um, the final energy demand target. So Fit for 55 had the 9%, Repower U had the 13% reduction, as far as I remember. Um, now, what we see from the provisional agreement is that we end up at 117 and that's what we follow. So it's neither Fit for 55 nor Repower EU, but it's what is agreed um, between Council, Parliament, and Commission. And maybe also that's something where we can transparent also when we have the informal um, exchange with Commission on the scenario development, um, they confirm that we should follow the provisional agreement on these targets. This is not only the final energy demand, it's also linked, for example, to the rest share, the 42.5 percent, for example, in the middle. So that's the yes and no. Whatever is agreed um, on a provision agreement, also where we see from Commission uh, the the direction, the guidance that we should include this, we go for these targets. I think maybe we can take. Um, I don't know with the time, but one more question. <clears throat> uh, there is a question from. Uh, um, Tyril uh, says that uh, within the set of scenarios you are testing, do you plan to take into account the possibility of an acceleration in the deployment of uh, fossil free resources beyond current EU targets driven by economic and climate factors? So, um, as I mentioned, as we mentioned that in the regulation, we are asked to be on targets. <laughs> so uh, it's actually um, a bit difficult to uh, uh, exactly duplicate uh, these targets, but uh, um, we um, as we are mandated by the regulation, we are not 
I mean, uh, we have been mandated to create scenarios that are on targets uh, with some possible ranges. So uh, we don't know uh, right now uh, what will be the result uh, of the uh, scenarios that we modeled, but you will see there the ranges of rest. So indeed, for uh, some uh, races, the upper limits are beyond uh, what is currently European targets. So uh, based on the optimization of the models itself, uh, it might end up a bit uh, low, higher certain technology uh, in certain scenario. I'm talking about the ENGA scenarios, but we will see it uh, in the uh, next slides uh, where we will present you what are these ranges. So because uh, the model at the end optimizes itself according to these ranges and the costs uh, and the methodologies. Uh, I see one question. Thank you. Good morning, citizens. My name is Angelos Harlaftis, Epaphos Advisors. Um, the question is, can we see the last presentation slide, the last slide of your of the last presentation? Is it possible? Yeah, over here you are mentioning uh, energy efficiency first principle is reflected with 11.7 reduction final energy demand. Uh, but uh, according to the studies, we will have a, a, a big request for uh, augmentation of the energy consumption. How do you come in this result? How? Uh, what do you mean energy efficiency? So uh, we took this actually directly from the energy efficiency directive. So in the energy uh, efficiency directive that um, they mention about in this provisional agreement that uh, done uh, among the institutions, they are talking about 11.7% of reduction uh, on the final energy demand. How we achieve this uh, for NT scenarios, all member states are obliged to uh, follow this EED, uh, Energy Efficiency Directive, and uh, supply their demand, accord, uh, demand input parameters according to that. So this uh, step has been taken care of the member state level. And uh, for the DENGA, uh, later in the presentation, we will see that uh, while uh, we um, uh, apply the energy efficiency, it depends also the uh, which uh, scenario we are talking about, but uh, Repower EU, for example, announced uh, kind of in renovation rates uh, or uh, improving efficient uh, technologies, uh, increased electrification. There are different type of uh, energy efficiency introduced based on the different scenarios, but we will see the demand figures later today. Uh, there we will be able to see uh, what are the uh, levels that we are talking about and the details also. Um, all right, um, I think uh, we can um, proceed uh, with the uh, next topic uh, where uh, I will start with presenting some draft supply parameters and uh, you will uh, have uh, more understanding about the, uh, the uh, shares of the technologies and also the costs. And then uh, Alexander will uh, continue uh, with the uh, hydrogen and methane import potentials and the supply tool. So uh, starting with the uh, solar and wind onshore trajectories here, um, it is, uh, let me give a, a bit of a contest and the methodology, how we came with these numbers. So uh, the blue line that we are seeing here, I will try to uh, take a, this blue line, it's uh, best estimate, uh, which means that uh, we collected these figures from TSOs and they submitted uh, country-based uh, capacities according to the uh, NECPs. Uh, and um, these capacities will be directly used in the NT, uh, National Trend Scenario. Uh, just a little um, um, disclaimer here that uh, we are still in the, some discussions for some countries, so uh, they might uh, slightly change, but uh, this already gives a, a quite a good idea on what we will see in EU27 level. And then uh, while we are collecting these data sets from the TSOs, we ask them also, according to your national expertise and NECPs, what could be the lower and higher ranges of these technologies? Okay, this is your best estimate, but uh, within the accept acceptance uh, criteria and uncertainty, what could be the higher and lower ranges? So they provided this information uh, also for these time horizons and uh, 
as I said, that this blue line will show the national trans capacities, whereas uh, for the green and red, uh, we see it as that's it, because it's not set in stone, it's upper and lower uh, boundaries that we will put in the model. And these are defined for each country according to the, their national uh, input. So, um, which means that in solar PV, uh, in the E2040, for example, will stay between here because we will, uh, uh, according to their storyline, we see uh, higher, uh, but we don't know yet. Uh, but it will be kept with here. So it can not go beyond this number, but it can be between here. And also uh, same for the low side. So these are the boundaries that set. Uh, and the same uh, for the wind onshore trajectories. So the data sets coming from the TSOs and uh, we set the capacities and the same trajectory for both scenario. The differentiation among and many others will be initiated with the costs as well, which I will present you uh, soon. And in wind offshore, we have a bit of a different uh, uh, methodology because uh, as you might know that uh, according to the regulation, we are asked to develop offshore network development plans according to the member state non-binding agreements. So uh, we received non-binding agreements uh, by end of uh, January and uh, we have an internal group here, ONDP uh, project team. And these, they, uh, according to these non-binding agreements that uh, you see uh, here on this table based on the sea uh, basins, uh, they have distributed together with the TSOs and member states and also communications with the commission, distributed these uh, uh, non-binding agreements within the uh, PCD zones. Uh, even more granular zone than bidding zone. And uh, to be make sure that we align with the, these non-binding agreements and also align with uh, ONDP study, we take our minimum and best estimate with these numbers. So uh, they will be this, uh, like the expansion will start uh, from these numbers and we ask TSOs again if it's possibility to expand further. So we will give model opportunity to invest even further if it's uh, uh, economically optimized within the model. So I want to uh, make a point also that uh, before uh, I, I forgot also in the next last slide in 2030, we see still the range. But as I told you that uh, we will have only one scenario. So even though there is a range, uh, we don't uh, take it into account. We start from here and then expansion will be like uh, will be uh, only in 2040 and 2050, this differentiation. Um, and when we look at the nuclear in our model, we don't have uh, nuclear as an expansion candidate. So uh, we don't have trajectories or costs on the fuel price uh, for the nuclear. And uh, we ask directly to the TSOs uh, uh, what would be uh, the best estimate on uh, your country, the nuclear capacities, and what would be the high and low uh, option. And according to the storyline, uh, we see that in global ambition, there is more role of the nuclear, whereas in distributed energy, lower. So uh, that's why uh, uh, we see here that in the blue line, it represents uh, national trends uh, and uh, green line uh, uh, global ambition and red line distributed energy as collected from the TSOs. Um, and last but not least is the battery trajectories. So for the battery trajectories, um, we collected the TSOs best estimates and then um, we connected, linked them uh, with the solar uh, capacities. Uh, we linked um, prosumer batteries with uh, rooftop solar and uh, utility scale uh, batteries with the uh, uh, PV farms. So we calculate this percentage and then we apply the same percentage with the high solar trajectories to calculate uh, the uh, prosumer uh, traje uh, batteries trajectories and utility batteries trajectories. Here again, uh, 2030 will be starting point and then uh, the blue line will be the minimum levels and the expansion will be possible towards green dots. And uh, the technology costs. So the technology costs are quite important because they will, uh, as I mentioned, that the trajectories will be the boundaries will set for both of the scenarios as the same. And the cost will be one of the important elements that will differentiate this, um, trigger this differentiation. And uh, what we presented to you, uh, what I will present you soon, it's the base 
uh, costs that we gathered from the sources. And um, in order to make sure uh, that the, there is a meaningful deviation, we differentiated them. And why 15% and 20%? It's uh, our uh, kind of uh, uh, experience from the last cycle. We see that uh, more meaningful present uh, differentiation we obtain with these percentages. And of course, in 2050, we want more uh, differentiation than 2040, which means in the EPV batteries and onshore will have 15% uh, lower price, where global ambition will have 15% lower price in offshore technologies, and the percentages is 20% for 2050. And um, when we uh, select the uh, define the cost, technology costs or uh, uh, sources, we try to make sure that the study covers 2030 to uh, till 2050 time horizons. Uh, and also, we are trying to make sure that we are. Um, uh, as extent possible using the same uh, source so that uh, the assumptions don't mix. Uh, so um, for solar, we are using the Danish and, uh, agents technology catalog as we used uh, as the last uh, cycle uh, with the updated costs um, and uh, for both rooftop PV and utility scale PV. And um, for uh, wind onshore as well. So, um, here uh, we can see that uh, from 2030 to 2050, uh, there will be a, a decrease uh, as uh, in the solar uh, cost uh, technologies. And uh, for wind on to offshore, um, it's a bit uh, particular situation. Uh, soon uh, we will also explain about the offshore methodology. Uh, there uh, you will get more details how we will model offshore. Uh, but in terms of cost, uh, we will have some components that model can invest. And this will be uh, either uh, in terms of the platform, uh, in terms of the turbine, it can be EC, DC, uh, or uh, these are radials or uh, can be hub uh, uh, specific hydrogen or uh, electricity hubs. And based on the, um, I mean, how this differentiation done will be explained in the methodology based on the distance and also based on the deepness, uh, there will be either fixed or floating technology that a model can invest. So, um, for example, uh, if uh, a model uh, can take, for example, for a hub, uh, it will take a fixed hub here that includes uh, array cables, uh, platform, uh, foundation installation. And then after that, it can choose uh, the uh, invest in the cable based on the distance. And of course, once uh, it connects to the uh, shore, it will invest. Uh, it, it should come with the package of onshore HVDC stations. But there is an option also same hub uh, invest in the electrolyzer offshore and then pipeline. Uh, whereas in uh, hydrogen uh, offshore hub, we see the electrolyzers are here, uh, so uh, you don't need then electrolyzer offshore. But again, this can uh, extend uh, also uh, to um, uh, to electricity. And to give you an overview on uh, these are the costs, uh, uh, the radial, uh, the hub uh, for a hydrogen and electrolyzers. And uh, there is a difference, uh, of course, uh, the cost of the cable and the pipeline uh, and uh, onshore HVDC station and the electrolyzers offshore that also includes additional installation, water treatment uh, platform. Um, so uh, on the last slide that I will present today is the battery storage costs. So here uh, we could have used uh, the National Agency catalog, but we had some um, some exchanges with the ease as well to understand what is the duration of the storages typically in Europe. Uh, it was like between two hours and uh, it could extend three hours, uh, which was not present uh, in the Danish agency catalog. Uh, so that we uh, found another resource that we could use uh, annual technology baseline uh, that duration with the two hours and uh, for the utility scale and the factor also is two for the residential and uh, we took their uh, this source as a reference. So, of course, all these uh, trajectories and costs are uh, available in our downloads uh, section in our website. And uh, of course, uh, there's they are part of the consultation. Now, I think it was my last slide. I will hand over to you. Okay. 
Thanks, Nalan. So now we look at the commodity and CO2 prices. Um, you see for basically all the commodities that we have in our scenarios, the price is linked to the time horizons 2030, 2040 and 2050. For some um, of these energy carriers, for example, for Lignite, we have just taken the same price as last cycle. Um, so I would focus now on the, let's say, gray, uh, it's almost, it's hard to see, but some are gray shaded energy carriers. So starting with hard coal, going to blue hydrogen, and then starting again with synthetic methane to heavy oil. And of course, the methane, um, overall methane price for NT plus for DE and GA. For these energy carriers I've just mentioned, we use the IEA World Energy Outlook as a source. Um, we take the announced policy scenario um, and we are going that way because we think it's beneficial to go for a set of prices that are coming from one consistent scenario. So we could have also easily picked prices from, let's say, 15 different studies, 15 different scenarios. Um, and also to be transparent, we had, a, we had some discussions of, in particular about the development of the natural gas price. But we came to the conclusion that it, it's really worth to go for one consistent data set here, because then all interlinkages between the energy carriers are hopefully, let's say hopefully, considered here, um, or at least it's thought of, instead of picking from various sources um, and having then an inconsistent picture. Um, maybe a few words about the gas price, the methane blend, what do we mean here with these uh, calculations? So for 2030, 40 and 50, the composition of methane is changing over time. While the majority of the methane in 2030 is still natural gas, it's changed over time. It's moving towards biomethane and emethane. As you can see from the table, biomethane and synthetic methane are much more expensive. The commodity price is much higher compared to natural gas. And that, of course, needs to be reflected in an overall methane price. Because for the modeling exercise, we need to put one price on methane, and that's the composition of natural gas biomethane and synthetic methane. So that's also important to keep in mind if you see different prices. In the end, we will use the gas price for the methane price for uh, what is shown here in the last three rows. Okay, does that work? Uh, it works, all right. Next topic, um, hydrogen import potentials. So we have looked um, at potential sources for the import of hydrogen. All in all, we, we identified four different sources. These are Norway, North Africa, Ukraine, so pipeline-based imports, and then the imports, hydrogen imports by ship. We have here looked into various sources because we think it's worthwhile to identify the upper limit. And keep in mind, we're talking about potentials here, not about actual imports. So to identify a feasible upper range for each of these sources. As you can see in the, under the line, the total ranges from 516 terawatt hours in 2030 up to 1,813 terawatt hours total in 2050. But as I said, please keep in mind, this is really the upper limit, the upper potential. It doesn't mean that these flows will materialize. Okay, let's go to the next one. All right, it works, fantastic. Linked to the hydrogen imports, now we look at the hydrogen import prices. Um, we have taken the sources. The, um, okay, let me go one time back to see what were the sources again. So that was Norway, North Africa, Ukraine, and by ship. So that's where we also dedicated some export and importer or import countries to. So North Africa, for example, is in fact then in our scenarios, Algeria, exporting the hydrogen to Italy. For Norway, it's the export of hydrogen to Germany. 
Ukraine to Romania, Hungary, and Slovakia. And the hydrogen import by ship, I haven't mentioned that before, it will come as ammonia. So we see um, projects um, for our TYNDP where companies want to set up import terminals for ammonia or they want to use existing import terminals and they want to attach an ammonia cracker next to it so that they import the ammonia and then this is reconverted to hydrogen to be injected to the grid. That is meant when we talk about imports, hydrogen imports by ship. It's not meant primarily liquefied hydrogen for various reasons we see. And I think also with the projects linked at the moment only to ammonia, that this will be um, for now the most plausible way to receive uh, hydrogen imports via ship. We use then for the 2035 and 2045, but that's rather a technical comment and interpolation between these uh, time horizons. And then furthermore, um, as Nellen mentioned, um, linked to the storylines, distributed energy is looking more to self-sufficiency, which also means less energy imports compared to global ambition, where we expect, according to the storylines, a bit more, a bit more imports. This is reflected in the prices of the hydrogen imports. So for DE, we increased the price by 15% in 2040 and 20% in 2050, compared to the baseline prices you can see here on the slide. And global ambition, we do the, the reverse. Um, we reduce the baseline price by 15% in 2040 and then by 20% in 2050. So to make sure that when we run the modeling exercise, we run the model, that uh, we see not outcomes that contradict our storylines. Let me go to the next slide. I think it doesn't work, so Nellen. Okay, so now I talked a lot about the hydrogen import potentials and the hydrogen potential import prices. Now we're looking at the CH4. What could be possible CH4 import supply potentials? Here we have again <clears throat> a bit of differentiation between import potentials coming via LNG. So we have various regions where the LNG could come from Middle East, North Africa, North America, and others as kind of a collection for all other possible sources. And then we have assessed the pipeline import potentials coming from a wide range of possible countries, starting with Algeria and ending with Cyprus and slash Israel. Also important here, this is possible potential, the absolute upper limit in particular, and uh, David will present this in a few minutes, in particular with the decrease of the methane demand, we will certainly not reach these potentials. So it's rather a question, I would say more for 2030, if there's enough import potentials for methane compared to 2050, because in 2050, the methane demand will be significantly lower compared to today's levels. So then I think we can say for sure that the import potentials will be sufficient. Then um, again, a bit of switch on the topic. I'm now talking about the supply tool. So how do we define the total energy demand? It consists of four components. We have the final energy demand. That's also something that we have published where we ask also your opinion on these figures for DE, for GA, um, also for NT+. We have an energy demand for conversion. This means, for example, if you use SMR, then you have a methane demand for the production of hydrogen. We have an energy demand for heat and we have an energy demand for electricity generation. But the energy demand for electricity generation, we don't have it yet because we haven't performed the modeling exercise yet. So these four components adding up is the total energy demand. How is this then supplied? For this exercise, for this purpose, we have created what we call a supply tool, but no worries, it's Excel-based, so it should be hopefully rather straightforward to access, where we develop um, the supply pattern for all scenarios, meaning for NT+, for DE and GA, 
for all time horizons, 2030, 2040, and 2050, for all main energy carrier on EU27 level. What do we mean with main energy carrier? We have one category called solids, and under solids, then we have lignite, for example, hard coal, all gathered under this category. So if you don't find all the categories from the commodity price list, don't worry, it's then aggregated to some what we call main energy carrier. And for methane, hydrogen and liquids, we develop demand and also the supply on a country level. The idea behind this is that we want to show uh, if these countries are particular focusing on methane and hydrogen are a net exporter or net importer of methane and hydrogen. It does not define, and that's really, I want to emphasize, it does not define if there's an import need for a country where this is coming from. It just indicates that a country that does produce, for example, less hydrogen via power to gas than uh, to cover the hydrogen demand. So um, also here, what you see on the, on the um, lower right part of the slide is how we uh, try to translate this um, into some graphs where you can see, for example, the imports of methane, um, of natural gas, of synthetic methane, biomethane, but also the production on EU level. Um, we have published the supply tool, so it's uh, available for you to check. We also have tried to make really as transparent as possible all the assumptions also on conversion factor, on efficiencies, uh, on, on the sources we used to um, retrieve this data. So please have a look at the supply tool and give us feedback until 8, 8 of August. 8 of August, how, if and how we can improve the tool, if we have overlooked something. So um, that would be much welcomed on our side um, if, if you can, um, can check that tool. And now I got a small nudge to go to the Q&A. So please, Nathan. <laughs> All right. So. <clears throat> There is a question about the uh, targets uh, regarding to the uh, European Advisory Board uh, advice on the EU's 2040 climate target leading to 1995 emission uh, for 2040. Uh, for currently in our scenarios, we don't have the 2040 target uh, for um, explicit number, but we have a target that we will make sure uh, that uh, 2050 carbon neutrality uh, is uh, ensured and in 2030, 55% emissions reduction has been uh, uh, achieved. So uh, we will uh, present, uh, of course, the results for 2040 as well uh, to see uh, what does it mean uh, in terms of uh, emission reduction in 2040 in our scenarios. And um, but at least for this cycle, uh, we will not have explicit target for 2040. Uh, but uh, having also some, uh, again, the discussions from the Commission, uh, we expect uh, 2040 targets from them as well, but next year, uh, so which will be already too late for our scenarios, so uh, probably for the next cycle. It's one of the important points, the carbon budget and uh, also the emissions that we would like to focus today, uh, where we can uh, also get uh, more inputs and insights uh, about this uh, equity uh, shares, but uh, we will tackle this later. Uh, Alexander will present uh, where what is uh, the current uh, consideration for uh, our um, carbon budget. And uh, then uh, the question uh, can go to you, uh, Alex. Yeah, sure. So the question is, why is Russia considered a potential import origin when one of the main points is independence from Russian gas? True. Um, what I have presented regarding the import potentials from Russia, this is reflecting the current, what we call indirect flows from Russia to Europe still. So going via Ukraine and Turkey. Um, we also see that the methane import potentials are so high compared to the decrease of methane demand already in 2030 that most likely we will not need Russia as an import source. But that's something um, we cannot 
um, model within the scenario scope because in the scenario scope we model the hydrogen and electricity system but we have not yet incorporated the methane system so this means we cannot um, let's say define this in the scenarios but at least if we look at the sheer quantity of the import potentials methane we have then probably the Russian uh, import can be left out without causing distortions to the system. And uh, the next question from uh, Thomas Lewis. Um, the question is, uh, do you intend to also consider for our utility scale batteries, especially after 2030? Uh, to be honest, um, why we selected two hours was based on the study that you provided us and also the input that we foresee through hours between uh, three hours. But if you uh, uh, believe uh, and uh, we have uh, the stakeholder feedback on uh, con we should consider for our utility scale batteries, uh, we could uh, include it as well. The study that we are using provides also for hours as well, uh, as far as I remember. Uh, but um, I mean, uh, this should be uh, uh, really based on the feedbacks that uh, here, especially East feedbacks, is quite important for us. So uh, if we have received this feedback, uh, we could also consider for our utility scale batteries. Currently, it's only two hours. And maybe we can take the last question. Um, you can... Uh, yeah, uh, the, what extent will the cost of each scenario will be analyzed and published? We don't publish, uh, we don't analyze uh, the cost of the scenarios. So um, it's, uh, I mean, uh, we don't want to uh, also say that uh, one scenario is uh, better than other. Uh, so it's indeed uh, what we want to publish is the um, the. Uh, Base the preliminary uh, purpose is to provide uh, the uh, infrastructure levels, um, demand and supply, and the uh, levels to the two NDPs so that they can uh, further analyze the infrastructure needs. Uh, but uh, within our uh, scope, uh, we don't calculate uh, the cost of the scenarios. Uh, one, just one comment here. Uh, David Radu here, uh, scenario building technically from NSOE. Uh, we don't publish for the reason that you just mentioned, but it's not like we don't look at the cost of the scenario because in the end, the investment problem at the core of our methodology is a cost minimization problem. Mm -hmm. So it is accounted for and it's cost that drives our scenarios, the, how, how our scenarios look like. But because of the reason that you just mentioned, yes, we don't, uh, we don't let's say, evaluate it per se. Mm -hmm. We don't evaluate it indeed. Maybe. Yeah. Just, just to uh, maybe uh, look at it, uh, the focus of us is indeed to look what infrastructure is needed for a certain storyline. And we only capture part of the whole, let's say, uh, scope. And that's why, let's say, showing the cost of a scenario is not realistic because we don't have, let's say, everything that starts up front or everything in the back. So it would only give, let's say, a piece of the puzzle without knowing the cost of before and after. So we don't capture the whole value chain. So publishing this uh, re, uh, value would more confuse uh, than help uh, the part. On the other hand, within the storyline, we try to come up with, let's say, the most cost effective uh, solution. And that's where we use the cost for. So. We cannot capture everything. That's a bit the reason why a total uh, scenario is not being picked up. The energy sector lately we have the flexibility term, which is under investigation. What uh, what means? Uh, of course, the, the question is: uh, of course, we have all this data, which is logic what you are uh, telling us. Uh, but uh, already the 10 year the scenario still is uh, working. I remember the first meeting, it was um, 2018, something like this. Uh, so we have some data um, in order to compare the scenarios each year and the simulations and the modelings we are following. Uh, and uh, what we expect from uh, 2030 or 2040 or 2050. So what is the diversification of the applied data? Uh, up to the moment for your for your studies for your scenarios
are, are you asking the lessons learned how we uh, uh, implement it? Okay, then uh, uh, I understood you well. Uh, this is uh, definitely, let's say, part of, let's say, our uh, improvements that we look at. What do we need to model? What did we capture? It's also the uh, scrutiny that we did together with the TSOs, how to look at the data, how to pick up, but also the realization, uh, let's say, uh, forecasting the future is impossible. So what we try is with the storylines to indeed capture the bandwidth that currently is, let's say, accepted within uh, the European community and therefore using benchmarks uh, also being mandated by the European Commission to follow the targets. Uh, that is for us, let's say, an important uh, driver to, uh, let's say, look at that side because policy is going to drive a lot in what is going to be realized. So this is a bit where Yes, use lessons learned as much as possible eh? with the engagement of the TSOs, uh, which are, let's say, uh, in the basis, looking at the storylines, but also follow up quite well on what are the policies that is going to drive the energy transition, because a lot of what we're doing now is policy driven. And that's, let's say, how we try to capture the future as best as possible. All right, so Alexander and Nolan just gave us some um, insight into the supply side and the next uh, step would be for me to go through a couple of insights into the draft demand parameters. Um, I'm going to try to be as fast as possible because we're quite a bit behind schedule here. Um, okay, so this is working. A couple of minutes ago, you saw that we are basically developing three scenarios. Uh, I'm going to start with the NECP driven scenario, the national trends, and then we're going to go towards the deviation scenarios. For the national trend scenario, again, this is NECP based data provided uh, through data collections that we do with the member TSOs. In terms of demand, the um, let's say defining target is the final energy demand that Alex uh, mentioned previously. It's a binding reduction target um, to a level of 763 mTO or like 8,874 8, terawatt hour at U27 level. This is once again a um, target which is um, part of the latest agreement um, reached for the energy efficiency directive in March 2023, and it represents 11, an 11.7% uh, reduction compared to the 2020 uh, reference scenario of the Commission. So this is basically our target. This is our reference. Uh, what we do, we collect data from TS. We collected already data from the TSOs, data which was aligned. So both electricity and gas TSOs uh, were um, supposed to, to, to align on, and they did align on this data. Um, when we collected this data from TSOs spanning um, a number of economic sectors and energy carriers, we saw that um, what the current, at that point in time, NECP numbers uh, reflected led basically to an overshoot of almost 10%, which meant that, yeah, what we got was slightly higher than what our target of, uh, yeah, 763 mTO was. This means that if you take a look at the plot, um, on the right hand side of, uh, of of this slide, we have the 2030 target uh, where the pointer is and where the arrow is, and we have basically this uh, couple of hundreds terawatt hour um, overshoot. In order to to reduce this gap and to fit within the uh, 8874 terawatt hour target that we have to comply with, um, we have this what we call gap closing methodology, which is um, which is developed uh, within the scenario greater methodology uh, sphere to basically further reduce the total, the final energy demand by reducing demand for highly polluting fuels. This includes crude, this includes solid. Um, this reduction, um, it's not yet included in the data that you might have seen in, as part of the consultation package. Uh, you, what you have seen as an annex to the storyline report is the methodology and how do we want to apply it. Basically, the methodology will 
apply um, pro rata, if you wish, uh, reduction of these demands for liquids in this plot and solids. Um, yeah, pro rata to the value that we have uh, on a country level and on a fuel um, on on a fuel yes on a fuel level. Now, one thing that I actually forgot to I should have mentioned at the very beginning of um, of of the slide, just to avoid any kind of confusion. When we say that we have a final energy demand reduction target, we need to understand and we need to be clear like what final energy demand or final energy consumption means. According to the EED, the Energy Efficiency Directive uh, definition, the final energy consumption represents all energy supply to industry, transport, and for transport we have to include international aviation, but not international shipping, households, services, agriculture, forestry, and other end users. It does not include international shipping, as I said, ambient heat, non-energy use, and the energy branch. So in this particular plot in the title, you see final energy consumption, but on some other next slide, in I think a couple of slides, you will see that we have different plots for final energy consumption and what we call total, which includes uh, what the final energy consumption does not. So I'm just showing this slide once again, a uh, slide that uh, Navan uh, discussed just for a couple of seconds, just to uh, reiterate the fact that we just discussed, you know, for like the last couple of uh, seconds, minutes about the national trend scenario and how the demand looks like in the national trend scenario, the NECP based scenario. And I'm trying not to transition towards the deviation scenarios, which, as the name says, it um, are intended to be, uh, yeah, <laughs> deviations from, uh, from from national trends. So how did we build these scenarios? Um, some of you, if not all of you, might already know this uh, this information. If the national trend scenario on the demand side were built um, based on data that we collected from member states, from any from TSOs through uh, their for, through the member state and ECPs, for the deviation scenarios, we used an open source tool called the Energy Transition Model. This is a tool um, which is open source. Um, it's out there on the internet, you can see basically, uh, yeah, you can see its structure, its code base, everything which we believe was a uh, very important and solid step forward in terms of transparency for these scenarios. Um, the tool has been developed for this particular purpose, so to, to study um, energy scenarios, and it has been used by governments uh, throughout Europe, by institutions, uh, quite a number of them. And it's available at this stage for EU 27 plus UK. So we have a coverage of 28 uh, European countries and we have been using this for, um, yeah, to set up our deviation scenario demand uh, numbers. The way we worked was that we, in as part of the scenario building exercise, so within the working group scenario building, demand experts from NSOE and NSOG, with the help of TSO members, of course, we set up the draft numbers. So we were trying to come up with the first draft, the first version of these numbers so that they kind of make sense. And from that point on, we passed the numbers to the TSO, to, to our members, for them to basically tune, let's say, if you wish, the um, the, the the parameters within these scenarios based on their yeah, local regional knowledge. Um, in a couple of words, this is how the process worked, but of course the process was quite uh, tedious, long, because this tool enables you as a user to define the very little, you know, the very small parts of demand creation. Um, and it results in a quite a gran quite a granular uh, in in a quite a granular process. Um, between this and this, there was a long time in which we had to like you know figure things out and try to put things together. But basically, this is the final view, the draft view, not really the final view, because right now these numbers are are, are with with you, with the stakeholders. And we're we're actually waiting for feedback on on them as well. Um, on the top right side, you have the final energy consumption. So basically, the same plot that you saw for national trends. Now you have it for distributed energy and global ambition. 
And then on the lower side, you've got the total demand, which means final energy consumption plus non-energy use, plus energy branch, plus international shipping. Uh, and then on the right hand side, also below, it's the equivalence so still for the total energy demand, but it's the split per sector and not per carrier. One thing that I should have mentioned already from the previous slide when I was showing the anti demand is that what we call biofuels, so you see it in green in the top right and bottom left plots. These are basically, this is just the naming convention that we used within the exercise and what we refer by biofuels, we actually mean uh, solid biomass in, instead. Um, overall, uh, what we see here is that um, increased electrification, um, yeah, basically increased electrification in distributed energy compared to global ambition leads to slightly lower energy demand for DE in 2040 and 2050. Even though uh, if you have seen the, and also Nalan has mentioned it a couple of uh, minutes ago, but if you have seen the storyline report, there is a certain element in the storyline, in, in the storylines about um, distribute the distributed energy scenario having an, an element of strategic independence, fuel and strategic independence, which led to an increased industrial demand in distributed energy. But in the end, uh, this uh, this increased electrification actually led to a yeah again slightly decreased uh, overall energy demand for DE. Uh, the same plots, I'm not going to spend here too much time on them because you have really the same plots, even in a slightly better version and easier for you to play with them. You have them on the visualization platform, so I, I really invite you to, to have a look and let us know what you think about uh, these results. My final slide just puts things a bit into some perspective because I've been showing you um, the national trends numbers for 2030 and 2040. And then I've been showing you the deviation numbers like the DE and GA numbers for 2040 and 2050. But the question is what happens when you could put them onto like one single plot? Does it make sense? What is the progression? What is the evolution of the numbers? What I don't have here actually, and I just realized this morning I forgot to put it, is basically the 2030 uh, target that we have, which is somewhere around yeah, 8874 that hour. So let's say between the line of 8000 and 10,000. Uh, what we see is that there is quite a good progression of numbers from NT2030 towards the GA 2040-2050. And what is equally important is that we have the ENGA 2040 and of course 2050, which is uh, leads to third, like further decrease in the uh, total energy demand, which stays below the 2030 binding target of, let's say, uh, close to 9,000 terawatt hours. So from a qualitative standpoint, we what we see is that even in a drop numbers, um, so numbers that the scenario building team put together, the TSOs have approved, um, we have a progression from 2030 to 2040, 2050 with a binding target in 2030, which is the only binding target we have in terms of like demand uh, levels, which uh, looks good to, to proceed. That was pretty much the short version of, of what I had to say. So if there's questions, uh, let me know. Do we take them in the order of the ranking? Because these are just not related to the demand. So take the demand related questions. OK. Uh, I see a question in the room. Yes, please, before we understand. Yeah, Tonya Pelosvini from uh, Electric. Uh, the two cl clarification questions one on the gap uh, closing methodology to understand what is the rationale behind this. Um, are you going to look at uh, what it implies? where you reduce the solid and the fossil fuels, what it implies? I mean, does it mean that you reduce uh, the use of the transport, uh, etc.? Uh, we will have an assessment of what it means, of course. Yeah. What we know is we need to be careful about two things. One, not to reduce something to zero, like just to, you know, to eradicate one particular fuel just because we need to reduce fuel somewhere. Second, to make sure that if we do this gap closing for 2030, the let's say trend towards 2040 is still relevant. So we don't reduce the demand for a particular fuel in a particular country to a level which is 
somehow below 2040 levels and then it just you know increases back again let's assume you have oil mm -hmm. at a given level in 2030 and then because of the gap reduction methodology and then it would increase back towards 2040 which wouldn't make any sense so these two are like let's say high level kpi that we will take yeah take into consideration but in terms of the implications of what this means for the actual demand uh we're gonna have to see what how I we can this assess. is important oh. yes <laughs> of course and the uh, second question, when I was listening, maybe I didn't understand one, but when I was listening to the storyline and narrative, I was expecting to see more hydrogen demand in distributed energy than global ambition. It's according to the storyline, it's the other way around. Mm -hmm. Distributed energy is a scenario which leans quite a lot towards direct electrification, whereas global ambition is a scenario where diversification of supply is one of the main drivers uh, and besides diversification of supply you have this um, idea that we will rely slightly more on imports than sourcing internally um, mm. the energy i think i have a question in the back sorry for that i i okay please so. thank you I, I think this is one thing that has been um really bugging us for quite some time that distributed energy is just distributed electricity and that the, 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 there's a huge change happening now. We have the 35 BCM biomethane target, which was mostly distributed energy, which is produced locally. We have quite a lot of hydrogen, which will happen locally. So the whole concept of that anything that is about distributed production has been only electricity. And I'm speaking electricity, district heating and gas, so I know all storylines. Um, it's just changing. And so the view to say distributed energy as a storyline is strictly on electrification does not fit even the name nor the purpose. Mm -hmm. And this is what I know that you're very far into the process and the discussion about what is really distributed energy is what's it about. But to say that it's different in gas and electricity because in gas we do not have local production has totally changed in the last 12 months. And when you looked at the and when you looked at the just published hydrogen strategy of Germany on Monday this week, when you look at it and compare it to the last hydrogen strategy, it's totally different. And we're going to and what we're seeing at the moment is a lot of projects happening exactly locally to say, okay, how, how can we bring the hydrogen to the industry because the industry wants to have it. So th th this is why my question is. I know that the storyline was set a lot of long time ago and that the, the path has been like this, but the world has been changing in the last two weeks, uh, two years, quite a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fair point. And this is something that uh, we need to account for better in the in, in the next cycle. Um, yeah. Yeah, indeed. Uh, uh, each cycle will have the storyline update review period. And for this, particular cases also scenarios reference group ETEC will play an important role. Is there time for our question? Um, we can take maybe. Yeah, I'm from the audience. Ah, okay. Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah. Mike, please. Microphone, please. And it's, uh, the question uh, supposed uh, is very good. Uh, we, do you take into consideration your modelings what's going on around, for example, what's going on in USA in the same scenarios you are working? What's going on in China, if you have data, or other places of the world? Uh, because this affects us. Uh, and the, the, my question is, um, in your uh, res uh, study scenario, uh, where do you put gas uh, in these resources of uh, of uh, production? You put electricity, you put uh, solid, uh, you put uh, this, this. Well, gas, I didn't see it. Uh, gas uh, because was... because uh, what I see in this uh, gathering here is that you put Enzo E and Enzo G. So when we are trying to electrify everything, which has a logic, why the gas is also participating? Do you think it's very important, like electricity? Thank you. First of all, uh, gas was in the, in all these plots that I've been showing was under the let's say umbrella of methane. That was just our convention for you know putting gas in there. Um, do I think one carrier is more relevant than the other? I don't. I think both of them, which are main carriers, will be 
uh, very relevant and very important for different parts of the decarbonization process because we do have some um yeah i mean it's I, I think it's a long process and there's also some sectors which are hard to you know decarbonize and we you might need some alternative to to electrification let's say maybe to to, to just call i i saw that i just wanted to, to compliment um david's answer so the the idea of these scenarios is to draw contrasted futures um because the i purpose of the scenarios is that they will use for infrastructure assessment for testing if the infrastructure can deliver and if it can't to identify the gaps the needs for the infrastructure therefore we do not favor one energy carrier over the other we have set up the storylines which shows directions let's say um but it's beyond our remit to 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 let's say promote one energy carrier or another so that's why um, we have a focus on maybe more electricity and distributed energy while we have the focus on other energy carriers including hydrogen and methane in, in global ambition that's also important to keep in mind that our purpose here is really to contrast the future not to forecast not to predict not to say this is how it will look like we say these are two, three possible pathways, how it could look like, and what does it mean for the infrastructure? And then we have one more. Yes, uh, uh, yes thank you. Uh, my name is Philip. I work for the European Roundtable for Industry. Would you mind going back to the one but last slide um, with total uh, energy demand, also the one per sector? Uh, that was in the bottom, yeah. the bottom right corner. Yeah. Sure. Yes, because I'm intrigued by uh, if if I see it correctly in terms of the color code, industry is gray, right? Yes. I I then I then wanted to ask: Is your assumption that by 2030, 40, or 50, uh, we'd have in Europe still the same? Uh, types of industries and the same number of companies in industry as now is the case. Uh, do you expect industry to leave Europe at all? And do you have a further breakdown of what uh, type of energy that industry is consuming over time? Uh, that, that would be an interesting to know. We do have the breakdown. We don't have it here, but for instance, on the visualization platform, it has to be. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it is. So if you go on the TYNDP scenarios visualization platform, you will see this breakdown. Um, the assumption, so this transition of like how the demand would look like from you know sector by sector, year by year, was a process that started from numbers that were in the previous TYNDP cycle that were already like approved ones. And then they were refined with uh, assumptions that we, for instance, corroborated with the data that we got from the commission, for instance. Um, in principle, the industrial demand, or like the, not demand, the industrial activity between the two scenarios should have been pretty much the same. But there was this element of strategic independence that kicked in in the distributed energy scenario, which made us equate it if you wish with the idea that some industries will be more active in DE than in GA in Europe because we're trying to source things locally we're going to try to reduce our dependence to you know uh, non-EU regions on specific things fertilizers uh, data centers were also like included in this pool of things that you know uh, were supposed to be more intensive um, from what I understand from your side, my, my understanding of your comment is that you would expect the, indus, the industrial activity to not to decrease. Yeah. That uh, industrial activity in Europe uh, goes down and, and leaves Europe, and therefore it can have an impact also on, on the demand. And therefore, I would be interested in, in going to your platform and seeing um, how you also project or how countries project, project that 
uh, yeah, industry? Is it going to electrify? Is it, yes. it going to um, yes. uh, use other types of, of energy and to what extent? That's another thing which on the platform is available, like a country based split, which would enable you to see, you know, to spot, you know, outliers in there. Maybe it's an issue with maybe you see an issue with some countries. And this would be the kind of feedback that we would gladly get because we would know how to address it in the next cycle. Our view on it was our view as demand experts, which were trying to have a look over full Europe. So that works to some extent. But then we went to the TSOs and those numbers were confirmed or not. But if you from an industrial you know, uh, association standpoint can tell us, OK, this doesn't make sense. This is definitely something that we would be glad to hear. So the main reason actually why we are consulting is to collect these feedbacks uh, because uh, I mean we are not experts especially in the specific sectors and that's why we are trying to connect with the, uh, the associations that represents the industries or transports or the technologies so that we get better insights uh, and uh, even if we cannot do it bilaterally uh, we that's why we publish this and all the information you can find uh, the technologies and also within the links uh, in the demand uh, profiles, uh, uh, demand uh, data sets, you will see the country links and each country links will have an estimation what the industrial size will go for each uh, subsector. So these are really important inputs for us uh, because these are based on the data sets that are uh, collected by the TSOs, but uh, uh, the representatives of these sectors knows the best. So. Um, OK, so time is far spent, so we are going to move on to the next section. We will be around at lunch, so if people have questions, you can always come up to us and um, ask us directly. And we will be answering the questions on the slidos as well. So my name is Dante Powell. I'm the innovation manager at NSOG in the system development department, and I lead the um, innovation team in the scenarios. So I'll be talking about the scenarios that we've, well, the methodologies that we've developed this year. Um, some are new, some are just improved on the previous processes. I will try to be a little bit quicker since time is short. <clears throat> so we have five innovations in this cycle. The first is the hydrogen modeling. This was, we did this for the first time in the previous process where we had four zones. Um, this time, <clears throat> Because of the introduction of different um, sectors in the model, we've reduced this down to two zones, one considering a hydrogen market and the other considering a dedicated uh, production zone. That's in regards to the hydrogen network, there will still be connection to the electricity through um, electrolysis. But we will be um, adding synthetic fuels to the methodology and we will also be doing explicit hydrogen to power modeling where we connect the um, CCGTs to the um, hydrogen sector. Next, we'll have the EV modeling. Um, it's similar to the previous process, but we did want to um, see where we could improve in terms of demand side response and vehicle to grid. Um, the third is the offshore modeling. This is brand new. Um, so in offshore modeling, we will be looking at uh, wind farms, um, electricity grid, hydrogen pipelines, electrolyzers, and there'll be a um, comprehensive interconnection uh, profile through the through the North Sea. The fourth is heat modeling. So here the heat modeling is limited to hybrid heating. So we don't model directly single heat pumps, single boilers, and we don't model district heating. These are the things that were discussed within the methodology development, um, but in the end, based on availability of resources, um, hybrid heat pumps is where we went. And then the fifth, we won't go into it in this presentation, but we do um, the way that we model the expansion. We, we shift from a rolling horizon um, methodology to a more clustered approach, so a flat five-year clustered approach just to make the model a little bit more manageable. So we include new things, but we also need to um, reduce. Sorry, the, the clicker's not working. Could I get the next slide? No, it should work. OK. OK, so first thing, um, of course, we are in the business of infrastructure development for um, electricity and gas carriers, hydrogen, methane. 
so the first thing we need to look at is how we establish our reference grids for the scenarios. This is the, the kind of first baseline. So on the electricity side, the reference grid has been set from the um, four CBA guideline. It's published. You can uh, read this online on the ENSO e page. Um, but essentially, it's that projects at time of the submission should be either in the um, the construction phase or at least have successfully passed the environmental assessment. This, by the way, is 2030 grid. We only have a reference 2030 grid. After that, everything will be built out as new grid through the scenarios based on different um, um, projects and different uh, investment options. So on the hydrogen reference grid, of course, it's much more premature um, since basically we're at the start of the planning. So what we do here, we look at the cross-border transmission uh, capacities across Europe, um, and that's according to data that's been submitted by TSO and project promoters for the year 2030. In terms of the investment candidates, so of course, if you're building new capacity in terms of renewables, um, hydrogen electrolyzers, you need to build grid as well, else all your energy will be concentrated in countries. So for NSOE's methodology, there are project candidates. So these are the CBA projects that were in the um, previous TYDP. These have been consulted with the um, European Commission, ACER, no, sorry, it's the ACER and the, uh, and the NRAs. For the, um, there are additional projects as well. Um, so, the capex cost includes the um, the cost of reinforcements, reinforcements. So you do have additional projects, but what they need to look at within um, the electricity um, within NSOE is the additional costs for uh, cross border reinforcements, um, which essentially reflect internal constraints. And then you have the conceptual projects, and these are essentially an investigation of new potential um, interconnections. Some are um, less certain, but you know, some already have kind of technical studies that have been done to um, establish whether they're feasible or not. So they are more prelim preliminary, but they do have a um, solid um, technical background to to the to the um, projects. On the NSOC side, what we have is infrastructure levels. We've we've always used a different, slightly different uh, methodology to what's used in electricity. In the methane system, we had three infrastructure levels. In the hydrogen, we have two. So in the hydrogen system, we have the low infrastructure levels. So this again is the list of projects submitted to the first TYDP, which was is what we've just um, done. And then the second infrastructure level is a higher level, but this includes additional cross-border capacities that have been submitted by um, TSOs. So um, once we have the, the two levels, what we do in terms of the expansion candidates, so what can be built new from the 2030 reference is the difference between the low infrastructure level and the high infrastructure level. Um, and there is an infrastructure level for each target year, so 2030, 2040, 2050, or have the low and high. Um, so we have the candidates, then we need to look at the cost. So we rely solely on external studies for this. The main study is the European hydrogen backbone, where the capex is split between repurposed and, um, and new pipelines. That's 75 and 25% respectively. Um, and then in terms of the length of the pipelines, you also need to look at the distance from capital to capital. But of course, when there is a hydrogen backbone already established, you don't go directly to the center. So um, we took from a EWI study, 15% of the distance from capital to capital. So deviation scenario topology. Now this is complex, so I won't go through all of it, but I'll just go by colors. So yellow, you have the electricity sector, transport, prosumer, electricity node. You'll see a red. This is the heat node. So this is the heat modeling that's connected to the prosumer node um, and to the electricity node. You have the purple nodes, which are zone one and zone two. Zone two includes the hydrogen market. Zone one includes more dedicated zones. Offshore wind farms, you can see at the bottom in a slightly dirty brown color. 
um, and that can supply energy both to the electricity or the hydrogen system. And then finally, in the green, you have um, synthetic fuels. So these can be synthetic fuels such as e-kerosene, you can have e-diesel, um, and you also have SNG. I'll go a little bit into these methodologies a little bit later, but um, that's essentially the topology um, that we are going for in this scenario cycle. Okay, so a little bit deeper dive into the hydrogen configurations. Um, so as I mentioned, we reduced this from 42, zone one and zone two. So in zone one, what we include is hydrogen demand, and I'll show how we split hydrogen demand into zone one and zone two later. But you also have steel tank, H2 storages, so um, normally dedicated zone, so you have steel tanks as buffers. You have steam methane reformers, so we look at what currently exists at the moment. Um, we don't increase the capacity, we look at the current capacity, um, and then we make an assumption that if these are to be used within the um, European system, they need to be combined with CCS. And then you have shared res. Shared res is essentially dedicated res. Um, so it's produced for hydrogen production, but you can connect into the electricity system later if it's economic to do so. Zone two um, essentially follows the same approach as we did last year, which was you have the, um, it's not so much just salt cabin storages, but it's more so underground storages. So, so larger storage capacities, um, as you see in the methane system, you will have a H2 grid. So this is the establishment of the hydrogen backbone and then the um, expansion into a wider hydrogen network. You have imports, um, these include ammonia and hydrogen and also dedicated res. And then as I mentioned, you have the synthetic fuel. So what we will do for the synthetic fuels is that we, for each energy carrier, so for EDs or for e-kerosene, for SNG, we will have one global node in the model. Um, and we will connect this global commodity, well, it's not a global commodity, but we'll connect this energy carrier to all of the um, zone twos in all of the countries. So essentially any country can feed into the production of this synthetic fuel. Um, CO2 must come from biogenic CO2. Um, so we calculate what is this biogenic CO2 potential within the scenarios. And then essentially the amount of synthetic fuels for all synthetic fuels is limited to how much CO2 can be produced. Then there's a global market. So this is essentially a flexibility to say, OK, this is the global market price. Um, and then you can see the arbitrage between should we produce it domestically or do we import this from um, other places around the world? So for the demand split, zone one and zone two, um, for zone one, we consider um, demand for feedstocks. We consider industrial demands um, and we consider transport. I won't go through all the splits, but essentially you will see that um, the figures in on the percentages of the, let's say, industrial demand. Let's look at industrial 2040. So in zone one, 30 percent of the industrial demand um, exists in zone one and 70 percent of the industrial demand exists in zone two. And it follows this um, pattern for all of the other sectors that we're looking at. Synthetic fuel productions at the moment, this will be in, in zone two um, in order to connect with these global markets and connect into this hydrogen market. Um, and then hydrogen steel tanks, what this essentially, as I mentioned, is a, a buffer. So if you have dedicated renewables that are used in an industrial process, you need to um, ensure that you have consistency in the process. And you can do this by um, using steel tanks. We calculate this by we look at the share of industrial customers within zone one. So 30% in 2040, 15 in, 20, in 2030, 15 in 2040. And we make an assumption that 25% of um, customers have steel tanks. This actually would be a good um, point of feedback that we could get. Um, but we don't want to, essentially, if you create too much, you create an old flexibility of storage within that zone um, and you want we want to be a little bit realistic. So what we say is that steel tanks can cover one day's demand. And essentially what that looks like in a nutshell is that in 2040, 7.5% of industrial demand will have steel tanks associated 
and in 2050, 3.25% of industrial demand will have steel tanks associated. So very happy to hear your, your feedback on, on those numbers. OK, it's a bit of a whirlwind, but I'm trying to go um, as quickly and as steadily as possible. But let's go into electric vehicles. So for electric vehicles, um, we are modeling directly in the model only passenger EVs. So we, we're not looking at trucks, buses, um, um, light duty, heavy duty, we're just looking at passenger. So we look at two infrastructures of EVs, one that are connected to streets. So not everybody will have will be able to connect their EVs to um, to their home. So you have street charging and you have prosumer charging. Um, the street charging is connected to electricity node, car goes to the street charger and charges. So this is the, the um, energy flow, prosumer node, cars go to go, cars go home and they're charged at home. So this is the energy flow for the prosumer node. There is the SR, so you can see there's a there's um, a bi-directional connection between both electricity and street and prosumer and street. This reflects um, essentially the vehicle to grid. Um, we then set standard efficiencies for vehicles. We um, for charge and discharge, we have um, efficiencies for how much energy the vehicle uses per kilometer. And then we model the demand in kilometers. So everything is calculated within the modeling tool. Uh, Sorry, no spoilers. Um, so also, I'm not going to go through all of this, um, but essentially these are the list of properties that we, we have. So we try to take a representation of the average European EV owner and we use publicly available data on capacities of EVs. Essentially, here we look at all of the EVs that are available. Um, and in particular, we look at the EVs that have been sold um, so that we can get a better kind of assessment of what the average capacities are in different countries. So we look at the um, so we take those capacities, which is going to be different if you have a Tesla Y to a Renault Zoe. So um, we need to look at these as well. Um, to go along with the storyline, we have a high capacity in distributed energy. And you can see in the second row capacity, where you have kilowatt hours per vehicle, you see the ENGA, you see the, um, the time frames, and then you can see what the kilowatt per vehicle is in DE and GA. Um, the rest of the parameters are, are aligned, so I won't go through all of those. Um, but just for the charging stations, I will say that for the home charging station, we do have a charge rate of, of five kilowatts per vehicle. This looks at, okay, you can have main charging going up to a wall charger and the street we look at, there's different levels going from 11 kilovolts to 22 kilovolts. So this is essentially how we um, create the properties for the EV modeling. Um, so you can look at this at, at your leisure. Okay. Going on to the offshore and infrastructure build out. So what you see here is on, on the right, you can see a very, very granular view of how the offshore zones can be modeled. And then on the left, you can see a very, very simplistic view, essentially where you only have radial connections. Um, we need to look at somewhere in between these and want a good granularity, but also it also depends on, so if you look at the one at the very right, you would need to break down your topology of your countries into much smaller zones to, to get a good view. This is not what we're doing this year. So we've gone for the third, which is the, the red. Um, so in terms of the hub, we, we do make distinctions between near, zone, near shore zones and far shore zones. So we have a offshore bidding zone. So that's an individual price area for each hub. So you may have a Danish hub, you may have a German hub, you may have a um, Dutch hub. Um, and then you have near shore zones. So these are essentially your radially connected um, offshore wind farms. This can be AC or DC. Then we say we have an exclusion zone of 12 um, Nordic uh, miles. So this is basically to look at shoreline protection and the not in my backyard effect where nobody wants to see the wind farms. So we exclude that zone as well. 
Um, additional to that, we look at a differentiation between the potential technologies that you can use. So you can have fixed bottom or floating bottom. Um, um, I can't remember the name, bat barometric, I think it's called. Barometric, yeah, that one, that's what he said. Um, so we, we use that data to look at the sea depths in um, different parts of, of the seas all around Europe. Um, and then we differentiate costs between those two. So we have one cost band one for more shallow depths and then cost band two for a little bit more deeper. And then this is essentially, this can be, you know, if this is the topology. Now, we for sure, we don't know that this will all be built out, but these are the candidates that you can use. Um, and this is a little bit of a simplified version as well, just to give you the... Um, an idea of what the offshore build out can look like. So interconnectors, they can either, so you have, um, um, let's say you have the German hub. So German hub can connect to its home zone, but it can also connect to a neighboring zone as well. Um, they can also connect in between each other. So the Dutch hub could connect with the German hub as well. Um, so there's, there's a lot of interconnections within the North Sea in itself or within the, um, the sea basins in themselves. Um, infrastructure, what we look at is a midpoint to midpoint. So each hub has a node. We look at midpoint to midpoint and we add a 30% cabling route factor. Um, and then coming on shore, we add a 30 kilometer um, distance factor as well. Um, yeah, so then the last thing is that the offshore hubs, they can be connected to the electricity or the hydrogen grid, or you can have kind of hybrid build outs where you have, um, let's say a hydrogen wind turbine that provides energy just to the hydrogen system and electricity that provides electricity just to the system, or you can have an electrolyzer as well where electricity can go through. Um, so that is the um, offshore hubs, and I believe the final is the heat sectors. So the ETIM was um, presented earlier. What we look at is the um, space heating and we look at the water heating demand. And we look at only households which will be supplied by hybrid heat pumps. Um, so we take this demand directly from the uh, ETM. We create demand profiles using um, a regression analysis um, in a similar way to the climate data that's used in the electricity and the hydrogen demand profiles. And then we also need to create a uh, country dependent coefficient of performance curves as the coefficient of performance is related to the temperature. So you have a different curve for each country. I'm not going to go through the equation, um, but there, there is scientific basis to how we create these curves. Um, so then what you see here is that the hybrid heat pumps, what they do, you, you may have an electric heat pump with a hydrogen boiler, or you may have an electric heat pump with a gas boiler. So these will be modeled separately because you won't have a hydrogen and gas boiler in the same household. So we split these into two for each country. Um, and essentially we create the heat pump capacities and the boiler capacities. Um, and we just base that on the peak heating demand that we ca calculated in the previous step. Of course, in reality, this may be a little bit different, but this is a simplification to ensure that both assets can meet the full demand within the household. Um, I believe that is the last slide. And I also believe that we're not taking questions just yet. So we will go after um, Alex presents the carbon budget methodology. If is that the, yeah. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. <clears throat> so I try to be quick. Um, we can still discuss the carbon budget methodology, by the way, um, in in the afternoon during one of the roundtables. So one roundtable is dedicated to the carbon budget. And it's also good to discuss it there because probably I will raise more questions than I can give answers right now. Okay, so we're really reliant on, on your input here. What have we done so far um, linked to the carbon budget methodology? So first step was to look at the IPCC 6 assessment report to see what they propose as a carbon budget. And they um, estimate different carbon budgets depending on to what temperature the global warming should be limited, either 1.5 degree or 2 degrees. 
um, and with which probability the global warming should be uh, successfully limited to the respective temperature. This gives carbon budgets, global carbon budgets between 400 gigatons of CO2 equivalent up to uh, 1,350 gigatons. Then what helped us um, in assessing a carbon budget for the GNDP scenarios is the um, report published mid-June by the European Scientific Advisory Board on Climate Change, proposing a 2040 climate target for the European Union. And they have decided to go for a carbon budget that is in line with limiting the global warming to 1.5 degree with a 50% probability. So this is our starting point for a global CO2 budget. We also factor in the uncertainty, uh, what happens with the non CO2 greenhouse gases, so what happens with methane, SF6, etc., etc. So depending on this pathway, either this 500 gigaton can be increased or reduced by roughly 220 gigaton of CO2. So there's some uncertainty here. Um, this means we have a global a range for a global CO2 budget, then few steps were necessary to translate the global carbon budget to adjust it to the scenarios. So first one, regional scope. We have allocated the global CO2 budget to Europe using a distribution key, using the population share as distribution key. We are well aware that there are other methods um, to uh, distribute the global CO2 budget to Europe, in particular for equity. Um, so far, we would also rely on your input to um, calculate a carbon budget based on equity, as we had also in the previous cycle, where we had both by population and per, per equity. And then the time horizon, the global CO2 budget that I've just mentioned and break down to Europe was covering um, a time horizon from 2020 on. But now we are in 2023. So what about the historic emissions? We reduced, we reduced the carbon budget by the historic emissions for 2020 and 2021 to ensure that um, given still, like let's say, the relatively high CO2 emissions in Europe, that this is properly reflected. And then we come to um, a European share of the global CO2 budget, as I explained, and we come to a possible range. So our proposal is not to have, well, let's say, one single number, but rather define a range. Um, and again, also we have really reliant on, on your feedback and we really have some good hopes for the stakeholder uh, roundtable later linked to this topic to um, decide if this possible range is something you find reasonable, if this is something where we need to redefine our methodology, if you prefer, or let's say if you have a good uh, methodology for coming up with one value. So that's something I, let's say, we put up for discussion um, this afternoon. But I just wanted to show this approach to the broader audience that everyone could get a glimpse of um, how we developed the carbon budget so far. Also regarding the LULUFs, um, that's something I have not addressed here on the slide because it's also something where we would like to start a discussion with you um, regarding this topic. That would be it regarding the carbon budget. And as uh, we are almost 10 minutes over time, I think we can skip the questions and I hand over to Tilo for the next steps and the closing remarks. Um, thanks a lot. And uh, yeah, I'm the one who's allowed to announce the lunch break, but I know that this, <laughs> uh, let's say, um, we want to be quick now. Um, so today uh, we will still have, as was already announced, um, the stakeholder roundtables only um, in physical attendance. Um, we will cover the topics demand, supply, methodology, and carbon budget. And uh, following up on these roundtables, um, some minutes will be published beginning of August, presumably. Um, 8th of August, we also have our deadline for the submissions to our public consultation. There's an online survey. Um, it's also linked uh, here in the slides if you open the slide pack later on. Um, and also, as was um, explained earlier, 
in August, we will um, have the final setup of the ETAC, so this external technical advisory group, um, which will then probably have its first meeting in September. Um, also, end of this year, we will have a second public consultation round, which will then focus on the modeling results of hydrogen and uh, electricity. Um, so to say, the outcome of what was defined based on your input in this public consultation. Then if we can go to the next slide. For those who will stay with us, um, lunch is until one. And then you just come back to this room if you participate in the roundtables and we will then introduce to you where you uh, should go next. And um, so then I think I can only thank uh, all of you, the teams of ENSOF and ENSOE who prepared this workshop. And um, yeah, you got to know most of them now by the presentations and also to the stakeholders for um, your attendance and also the good questions we saw on um, um, on um, on the website, and these will, as we said, be answered then in the follow-up to the session. Thanks a lot, and have a good day.